let's travel into the future. What will we see? I could sit there all day. You could sit there for a month and postulate it at what the effects of the world switching over to thorium energy would have been it's almost unfathomable. I think it's always been the right time for thorium. I think it's been the right time ever since the research was canceled in 1974. The United States would have probably achieved energy independence around 2000. Our fossil fuel usage would be diminishing every year. You wouldn't have nuclear waste issues like we're facing today. Fukushima wouldn't have happened. Three Mile Island wouldn't have happened. We would be producing continually less and less carbon dioxide emitted to the atmosphere per year. Oil consumption would be on the decline. Environmental quality would be on the rise. We would be in a very different situation now, and it could have happened. The great tragedy is it could have happened, you know, a third of a century ago. That's the part that I find almost so tormenting, is that was a very realistic future that could have taken place. We don't want to wait any longer for that future. In the 1950s, the scientists who created the atomic bomb offered a promise. By splitting the atom, we could have a limitless supply of electricity that could end pollution and bring peace to the world forever. But after the disaster in Japan, that dream has never looked more like a nightmare. I think it's, I think it's going to be a tough road for nuclear power, given the events in Fukushima. Let's face it, this is the first time we've ever seen uh, a nuclear power plant literally explode. Today, as the world grows increasingly desperate for clean energy, a new breed of engineers and energy geeks says we need nuclear power now more than ever. Fifty years ago, a forgotten government experiment seemed to prove another kind of nuclear energy could nearly eliminate the risks of meltdowns waste, and weapons. Now, in other news, an obscure metal that could energize our wor world. It's called thorium. It's eco-friendly, and there's lots of it. The amount of thorium that it would take to provide all the power to run your entire life is about the size of a marble that big. The Chinese are investing millions in research into reactors powered by the element thorium a metal proponents say as common as lead. You know, it's like, dude, what have you been smoking? You know, no one thing can do all that. You know, it can't, it can't make energy and be clean and help with space travel. You do feel a little bit like, uh, you know, an evangelist when you're talking about this stuff. Did the United States abandon a brilliant idea in order to build bombs? If thorium is so great, why aren't we using it today? And amidst all the fear and stagnation, who are the people who believe once again that nuclear can save the world? The key is something that has been almost uniformly overlooked by policymakers, thorium. And of course, in this room, we're hearing it. But we have to appreciate how little we hear about it outside of gatherings like this. We almost hear about it not at all. In March of 2000, uh, I just graduated from Georgia Tech and I went to Huntsville, Alabama, started working for NASA. And one of the first projects I worked on in my group was a, a nuclear-powered rocket. I didn't know a lot about nuclear and I was working with a colleague down the hall from me. And then one day I was in his office and noticed the book on the shelf, Fluid Fuel Reactors. And I could tell it was an old book. I opened it up. It was published in 1958 by the Atomic Energy Commission. And I said, well, what's this book about? He said, oh, I, I remember hearing some of the old timers at Oak Ridge talk about a different kind of nuclear reactor they worked on that was based on fluid fuel rather than solid fuel. I thought, huh, never heard anything like that before. Additionally, I saw the book talking a lot about thorium. And from the book, it seemed to say that it had something to do with making nuclear energy. I thought, I need to get further education. And I'll probably find out why it's not that great. Instead, what I found out was that he was even better than I thought. My lord, please forgive my ignorance, but what is thorium? <laughs> uh, I'm very grateful 
to the noble Baroness for this question because uh, clearly I've learnt quite a lot about it recently. It is, of course, for those that wish to know, thank you very much, um, it is named after the Norse god Thor. Um, it is, uh, comes out of monazite sands, which um, are largely found in India and Norway, and uh, there are all sorts of other facts that she can find in Wikipedia, as indeed I did. <laughs> my lord, my lord, my lord. Thorium is a naturally occurring, fairly abundant mineral that has the potential to release great amounts of energy if utilized in the right kind of nuclear reactor. It is found in every nation in the world. Uh, if you pick up a rock, it's likely there's thorium in it. It's very likely that there's thorium in the... In fact, it's certain that there is thorium in the granite of this rock right here. If we had a Geiger counter, we would be able to detect it. Thorium will power the world. That's our new bumper sticker. It's going to say, Thorium will power the world. Ask me how, and then have the little QR code there. That's my new version of Ask Me About Thorium. And maybe the last thing is just introduce yourself. I'm John Pitch, just so we and have that. Shouldn't should it we... be dramatic? Shouldn't the sun be like rising behind me? And John Kutch. So I'm, I'm John Kutch. I'm the executive director of the Thorium Energy Alliance. That's Vince Lukowski. I'm the grand potentate of, uh, yeah. of Thorium knowledge. And the dispenser of knowledge. Yeah, exactly. And uh, truths. <laughs> A company hired us to look at different materials, and thorium was one of them. You know, the short version is, they're like, what can you do with thorium? I'm like, you can't do shit with thorium. It's sort of like garbage in a way. And he's like, oh. I'm like, but it might save the world. And he's like, how can it be garbage and save the world? I'm like, eh, it'd take a long time to explain. He goes, well, can I invest in it? And I'm like, no, nah, it's garbage. And he's like, ah, oh, god damn it. And so he, you know, move on to cobalt or whatever. And But I never lost it. I'm like, man, you could save the world with this stuff. It's unbelievable. The trouble is, you know, it starts to sound like too fantastical, almost right out of the box, you know. You can't make nuclear weapons from it. It's available. It's right there on the ground, man. It's all around us, you know. You're just like, have, have I gone back to an ashram in the 60s or something, you know? Free energy, man, you know. It'll seem fantastical. It's like, are you telling me that serious people and scientists are looking into such a thing? And to think that think that this could have been common knowledge, you know, 35 years ago is, is upsetting, you know, but the, the fact that we still have this opportunity is exciting, and even if it does sound like, uh, you know, secret sauce and magic beans <laughs> and things like that. I'm Alexis Madrigal. I am a senior editor here at The Atlantic, and I wrote a book about the history of uh, energy technology called Powering the Dream. We're here at the Atlantic's new offices in the Watergate building, which of course is where um, the events occurred that eventually brought down Richard Nixon, which has nothing to do with us, but is also just interesting. Well, I think we have a really difficult time defining you know, what's green and what's, what's not green. But I've decided that for myself, um, the most important, the dominant issue, the thing that could wreck every ecosystem on the planet is climate change, and so therefore that's what I'm going to focus on. So for me, nuclear power is, is a green power source. The most exciting thing about nuclear power is that it could actually work in a way that saves the world. <laughs> and, the, and the scary thing about it is that I'm not sure as a society we are good, and I'm talking about American society, are good at dealing with difficult socio-technical problems like how you run a nuclear industry. You know, there's a guy named uh, Alvin Weinberg um, who is really a, a kind of a, a hero of mine, even though he was a big uh, nuclear advocate and I've written a lot about you know, solar and wind. And he wanted to try and deal with long-term energy issues in ways that were uh, serious. And he, he wrote uh, a lot about what he called the Faustian bargain of nuclear power, where essentially like we're being given this infinite power source, but as a society, we have to like come up with ways of dealing with it or it's going to, to destroy us. The thing that's sad is that that was like in 1960 and here we are like 50 years later and the United States still hasn't come up with a good solution for waste and still hasn't come up with a good way of even dealing rationally with what kind of nuclear power we want to have. I basically ask the question everybody else asks, you know, why aren't we doing this? Uh, but I'm the kind of guy that, that, 
you know, if I don't like the answer of why aren't we doing this, I decided, you know, well, I'm going to do it. This building is a 1889 firehouse that I bought, and it's basically my workshop. So it's an old ass house, and we redid all the brickwork, tuck pointed it. You know, it took about 10 years to do it like one chunk at a time. What are kids inspired by today? You know, kids aren't inspired by the moonshot. They're inspired by, you know, Farmville on Facebook. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of sad that, you know, the best and brightest minds don't work with these anymore. It's that sort of thing that I feel like, boy, if I can just bring a little bit of that back to the United States where, you know, people got paid for making things. We keep such a low profile here to begin with. You know, we do all this engineering work for companies all around the world and, uh, you know, nobody in this town really understands what it is we do, so you know, thorium would just be one more thing, you know, if we were like, hey, yeah, we do, we do thorium work out of that building, too. It's, it's just like, uh, <laughs> it's just like, uh-huh, okay, well, good to see you, John. This will be a really simplified version of a, of a molten salt reactor. A decade before he called nuclear power society's biggest Faustian bargain, Alvin Weinberg was one of the country's leading nuclear physicists. He invented the light water reactor, the world's most common kind today, the type used at Fukushima. But in the 1960s, as director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory, he began to pursue another idea, called the molten salt reactor. Instead of operating at high pressure with a solid fuel made of uranium, it worked at low pressure using a liquid fuel that could be made of thorium. Thorium has many advantages. It can produce about 90 times as much energy as uranium and a fraction of the waste. And that waste isn't useful for making bombs. The reactor was considered walk-away safe because it relied on physics, not machines or humans, to keep the reaction under control. So far, the, mil the molten salt reactor experiment has operated successfully and has earned a reputation for reliability. I think that someday the world will have commercial power reactors of both the uranium-plutonium and the thorium-uranium fuel cycle types. I think when people see it, they understand it a lot better. So a light water reactor, you're constantly trying to keep it from going uh, out of control. You're constantly trying to manage it with control rods and moving the fuel rods. Molten salt reactor is, is the opposite. You're constantly trying to keep it liquid. You're trying to keep it reactive. You're trying to keep it circulating. And if it ever stopped, it would just, it would just drain down into the drain tank or solidify in place or just stop reacting. So it's, a, it's just a much better design overall. This thing can't explode. This thing is ready to explode. And you gotta have redundant systems. You gotta have a pump and a pump and a pump and a pump. You know, it's not walk away safe. It's not self-controlled. You need, you know, computers and operators and controllers to constantly monitor this thing. Whereas this thing's completely self-regulated. If an earthquake and a 747 and a tidal wave hit it all at once and the chamber tipped over, what would happen? The fluid would flow into this hot cell, down this pool, and into the storage tank. Despite some hiccups, the reactor ran successfully for a record six years. But Alvin Weinberg's concerns about the safety of light water reactors, which were then being built in the United States, had made him unpopular inside the Nixon administration. In 1973, he was fired, and the reactor was shut down project was eventually terminated, but I still think that, well, eventually people will come back to this way of trying to react Today, the research lives on through the internet. On countless websites, thorium fans say the United States could build a new reactor with the right laws, around a billion dollars, and public support. There's environmental organizations that are just like, the only good nuclear power plant is the one in the sky, you know? And it's like, yeah, 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 fine, that's super great, you know? And when you're popping popcorn on the one sunny day a year in the middle of the day, because that's the only time you get your solar stove to work, you know, give me a call, I'll be over, you know? 
and we'll do our hand puppet shows in front of your candle, your beeswax candle. Alternative energies like solar and wind aren't yet capable of matching the carbon-free energy produced by the United States' 104 nuclear reactors. But that doesn't matter much to the people who live near Indian Point, the 50-year-old power station outside of New York City. Like many other reactors, Indian Points weren't originally designed to last this long. Today, residents have another dream in mind. I call for your immediate resignation yes. from the NRC yeah. as our federal government agency. Yeah. The plant is located 34 miles from Times Square. It's a very old plant. It's from the first generation of nuclear plants, the same generation that uh, Fukushima is from, that other plants that have had major problems are from Three Mile Island. You, you really have an accident waiting to happen. We should take steps now to secure the, the nuclear waste on the site, to shut the plant down and decommission it to make it safer. You know, newer design plants uh, are a, potentially a better design, although some of them are actually worse designs than the current plants. Uh, the fact is, uh, when you get down to it, you know, there's no way you can absolutely guarantee safety of a nuclear plant, I think. It's pretty obvious when you look at the past 200 years of human development that every new technology has spawned almost exponentially more new problems. And I'm here, if you can look down here, we're naked to nukes. We're all naked to nukes, and I can just give you the, the, the scream of the Fukushima's mothers. After the disaster in Japan, the thorium movement has a new opportunity to capture the public's imagination. Now, they're not just trying to influence change online, but at conferences, right in Congress's backyard. Uh, this is our third conference, and uh, the intent is to spread the word about the, uh, the tremendous benefits of using thorium as energy. You get this mix of the enthusiasts and, and uh, sort of the pro-am person and, the, and the, the, the guy that just learned about this over the internet and is just like, why are we doing this? And you know, they get in the high dungeon and they're like, I, this has got to be done, we must do this. The problem with thorium is that it's too good to be true. Yeah, don't say it's too good to be true. <laughs> the moon landing was too good to be true. This watch is too good to be true. Uh, and here they are, and so many other things. You know? It's a gift from God that we have thorium. It's only one element that we can do this with. And um, I'm looking forward to this moving on to the next generation. Hopefully in my lifetime that we do have a new generation of, of uh, nuclear power fueled by thorium. People see nuclear energy as something that's touchy. They're not willing to trust a new development, but I really just think that that's the way that it's going to take a while is because you have to change a whole system instead of just changing a few people's minds. The whole world waits to see what the United States will do and it's up to us to move on this because if, if we move on it then it'll free the rest of the world to pursue this stuff too. This would be like the great good thing that America could do not just for itself, but for the world. The flip side of that is that America could suddenly lose a lot of legitimacy in the world. If too much time goes on, if too much time passes, other countries are gonna say, this is too great of an opportunity, I'm willing to take the risk and go and pursue this on our own. This is a book which I wrote in Japanese, but uh, the meaning uh, is a sodium nuclear power, which is peaceful energies. We've been talking about passive safety in the lifter community for a very long time. After Fukushima, a lot of people started to pay much greater attention to this aspect of the reactor, but we are no Johnny-come-lately to this. When you're an undergraduate or graduate nuclear engineering student, you learn about thorium sort of as a, a side topic, but not as something that seriously would be used in the business. 
I'm Paul Rogge. I'm an Army Colonel and I work in the Army Training and Doctrine Command. I'm responsible for operational energy concepts for the Army. So I look at the requirements that soldiers need uh, to operate in places like Afghanistan or other parts of the world. And the thing that's made me interested in thorium is uh, that uh, it may have some benefits in terms of uh, proliferation, safety, processing efficiency, maybe even economy. And so uh, it's certainly an intriguing uh, technology. Um, we see the, the Indians and the Chinese and others pursuing thorium as a potential source. And so it certainly makes you wonder if that isn't something that we should be looking into if they find it so interesting. Uh, can you tell me what the role of thorium may be uh, and what the thinking is on thorium um, as a, a, a fuel, what the advantages are, what the disadvantages are, what the pros and cons are of thorium? While we are certainly interested in look and continuing to look at thorium as a possibility and particularly a possibility for, um, for the future, the fact remains that we have an entire fuel cycle built up around uranium and it would be a dramatic shift and a very costly shift to move on any sort of short time scale to thorium. How did we get locked into a technology as difficult and risky as the uranium light water reactor? When the Navy's Admiral Hyman Rickover was looking for a reactor to power his communist fighting submarines in the 1950s, he ran a critical test of the light water reactor. And it worked. You know, these things are big, complicated systems. The tests are all very risky. Uh, it's very difficult to get things right. So once something starts working, everyone just says, well, that one worked, let's just keep doing that. Whether or not the design technically uh, is the one that we would choose now. The military liked uranium because it could be turned into weapons easily. An industry, eager to keep costs low, wanted to stick with the technology it already knew. Other designs slowly vanished, and the light water reactor dominated. The other key actors in this whole drama um, are General Electric and Westinghouse. After the war, General Electric and Westinghouse wanted to retain the technological advantage that they had over other power plant builders. Those companies started to promote it heavily uh, for the reason that they could make a lot more money on it and they had a lot fewer competitors. And so you had a constellation of actors who all wanted a particular uh, design, that is to say the one that was out there, the boiling water and uh, reactor, to just go. They wanted these, uh, these, these basic designs to just be the ones that we standardize on and then start making money from. Um, whether or not they were, um, in an ideal world, the one that we would want to use. In every other field of technology development, we're happy to see an improvement of technology. Nobody wants 1950s computers, nobody wants 1950s cars. Why are we satisfied with 1950s reactors? You know, why don't we want to see technological advance? Nobody else says, you know, you gotta, you gotta stop developing computer technology. We don't want people to think old computers aren't good. You know, nobody says that. I took a, a fateful step very recently. I started a company to try to make this vision come true along with my partner, Kirk Dorius. And so we're going to be introducing Flyb Energy to you today, uh, a new company and, and one devoted to uh, making thorium a reality. These sort of small and modular nuclear reactors are just really exciting. Um, you can imagine them being used in all kinds of different ways. You can imagine them, I mean, one of the big problems right now with nuclear power, it takes like eight or ten years to build a plant. So you can imagine them being deployed much faster, which we're going to need faster deployment if we really want to decarbonize our energy system. But I think the, the basic thing is we're only going to find out by trying it out. I mean, the, the reality of these like sort of complex engineered systems is that on paper they look one way and then when you put them into practice they look another. And we need to try them out. Those things aren't really getting a hearing and I think that's something that you probably would hear most specifically from the Thorium guys. It's like a small group, this like hearty band of people who've been able to get themselves a feature in Wired but haven't been able to get themselves a real hearing 
uh, at the levels where they need to in order to generate a real industry. We have to get some key legislative aides and write, you know, legislation writers to, to convince the world that it's for real. The Thorium movement can't rely on promises of magic alone. We've heard those kinds of promises before, and the reality hasn't been pretty. But their crusade shows how progress is made by failing and learning, by believing and asking big questions. For the Thorium guys, the question now isn't if, but when. And for the rest of society, the questions they ask of us are more complicated. How are we going to answer them? The final word, though, is that it's still, you're just looking over that hill and there's a lot of fog in that future and, you know, Maybe China will beat us, maybe something else happens. We were hoping for something that would really be a game changer, that would say, we're going to switch to small modular reactors, and we're going to put our support behind innovative reactor designs, and, and maybe even most of all, we're, we're going to support research into thorium. Something like that would energize the world and you know, bring, back, bring us back in a, in a place of preeminence. You know that you all are the future of energy. You're the future of energy, and the future is today and right now and for forever and ever. This is what you guys have seen it. I'm hoping that, number one, it doesn't take all that many people to change the world. And number two, through the internet and social media, we can find each other, you know. Most people aren't like us. They aren't interested in these things. But that's okay, we don't need most people. We need some people. On three, say thorium. One, two, three. Thorium! Hey! The conference well done. I think we're going to get a lot of good, uh, good action out of this thing. We always do, don't we, Kirk? Absolutely. They keep getting better, everyone. <laughs> you did a good one. This is the best one yet. Yeah, it was pretty good. Right on. America has done tremendous things before. We have developed technologies, we've crossed a country with a railroad, we put a man on the moon. We can do this. This may be one of the greatest of all our accomplishments, is to unlock an energy source that can last for hundreds of thousands of years. And the time has come where we must do it. We are rapidly running out of alternatives. I know we can. I hope that we choose to.